Hey there, Reconciled Church. Pastor Kevin here. And we're back with the final installment in our series, Foundations Revisited, where what we're doing is we're taking our core convictions, the big uh, core values of our church, and kind of unpacking them. So before we get into our lesson for today, let's do a quick review. First time we got together, we talked about our name, Reconciled Church. We are reconciled. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, what we're saying when we by our name is it's a reference to Scripture, which talks about the fact that we are in one sense uh, reconciled sinners to God. That's who our that's what our identity is. But then it also speaks to our mission, what we are to do, uh, which is to share the message of reconciliation with others, to call others to be reconciled to God through faith in Christ Jesus. Uh, then we went into our values, and we looked at the idea that the, the significance of the gospel. We said the gospel is the power of God to save sinners and change lives. By that we mean, first and foremost, we're about getting that message, the message of Christ crucified, risen from the dead, communicated in everything we do, okay? We want, we want to be a church that basically saturates people with the gospel. Now, uh, the next week we talked about the idea of the church. We said the church is a picture of life in God's kingdom. What we mean by that is if people want to see what this life God is calling us to live is actually like, uh, they should be able to ha get an idea of it from looking at Christians, believers, gathered groups of believers. And the way that we treat one another should reflect the values of God's kingdom. And then third, we talked about... Um, uh, our personal change. We said our changed lives give proof to our message, meaning it's one thing to tell people uh, that Jesus has changed you, that Jesus has saved you, but when they can actually see that change at work in your life, it gives evidence, it gives weight to the claim. And then last week we talked about the need to uh, share the message of Jesus, our witness. We said in order to see lives change, our message must be proclaimed. That is, it's not enough simply for people to see our changed lives. We also have to be actively sharing the message of the gospel with people. We have to be actively sharing our faith with others. Now, our last core conviction looks at the idea of prayer, uh, which is one of those things that everybody wishes they did more of, uh, but most Christians would tell you is valuable. Uh, we want to be a church that really focuses on prayer, so here is our last core conviction for you. Prayer opens opportunities when there are none. Okay, let's discuss this. Uh, what is prayer? Like, really, when we talk about this, uh, we would say that prayer is communion with God or communication with God. Uh, but it's more than just that. Uh, it's it, Prayer is unique in that when you look at any other discipline, uh, that any other spiritual discipline that you might do, there's a certain amount of personal ability, personal strength involved in it. So uh, when we talk about sharing the message of Jesus, we can often look at like, uh, we can often have this desire for uh, being more eloquent in our speech and being able to explain it more clearly. Um, when we talk about um, uh, just good deeds in general, we're talking about a certain amount of self-discipline and things like that. Uh, prayer, however, is unique in that there's nothing that we do that is so utterly dependent on God and his power as prayer. Prayer is uh, a complete reliance on God because if you think about it, it's essentially saying, God, I'm trusting with you with this so much. It, it's, it's saying, God, I can do nothing if you don't act. I am desperately in need for you to act for this thing to happen. So uh, prayer is kind of the ultimate expression of faith in a lot of ways. Um, how does the scripture present prayer in the life of a church, in the life of a believer? Well, let's go to some scripture passages. Uh, key one I want to look at with you guys today is Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 through 4. It's written by the Apostle Paul. It reads, Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray for us also that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. 
All right, Paul instructs believers at Colossae to pray that God would present an opportunity to share the gospel. He's asking them to pray so he would be able to share the gospel with people. A couple things worth noting from this passage. First, prayer is a church-wide responsibility. It's not enough to say, we would assume that Paul is obviously praying these things. He's obviously praying, God, give me an opportunity, uh, open a door that I might share Christ. But he's, uh, but what he does here now is he turns to the church as a whole and he says, you pray for me. Okay. This is super important. Um, it's not just an issue of private prayer. Paul actually believed there was a benefit if more people were praying for him. Um, this tells me something. Fundamentally, this tells me that prayer is not just about me making my request known to God. It's about we, us, making our prayer requests known to God. It's about um, us coming together in something when we ask God for, uh, for things. Um, remember, it's God's plans to carry the gospel through the church, okay? God's plan to bring the message of salvation is the church. And so he doesn't just want you praying for yourself. He wants us praying for each other. Now, second, persistency in prayer matters. Paul says, continue steadfastly in prayer. In other words, you have already prayed for this thing. Paul is saying, don't stop. Don't give up. Keep praying. It's not a matter of just simply saying it once and once you've said it, well, I guess I said it. No, 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 no. God wants us to be consistent and persistent in our prayers. Third, expect answers. So Paul tells the church to be watchful with thanksgiving, he says here. This implies he expected a response and he expected that response to be favorable. Now, this is really important because I think this is true of myself as well, that often when I pray for things, I almost have to like hedge my bet. Like I have to be, have to, I start praying and I'm like, God, would you uh, heal this person? Would you hear my prayer? Would you uh, lead this person to faith? And then I have to go, but if you don't, I'm okay with that as well, or help me to be okay with that. Um <laughs> God sometimes says no or not yet as an answer to prayer. But I actually think that the general expectation of Christians would be that God is going to say yes to these things. Um, if he says no to them, it's quite likely that maybe our own motivations in our heart is off some, somewhat. Um, but just understand here that from what we see with uh, Paul, and especially when he's asking the believers to pray uh, for opportunities to share the gospel, he expects a favorable outcome. It's not a matter of like, but in case he doesn't, God knows what he's doing and he's all wise. Obviously that's true, but he prays with a sense of expectation. Fourth, pray for the means to accomplish the task. Paul not only prays for the opportunity, but the ability to share God's word with others. Notice the way he explains it. He says not only that you would open a door for him to share the mystery of Christ, but that when he does this, he would speak clearly. So this is important because like I said, I think sometimes we think God's going to give us the opportunity, but if we haven't prepared, we're just like, you know, it's tough luck. Um, instead, what, prayer, what Paul's saying is, God, give me the opportunity, but also give me the ability to share this. Think about it, guys. Do you think Paul didn't know the gospel like the back of his hand? Of course he did. And yet he still needed to, uh, he still felt the need to ask God to give him clarity when he spoke. So what all this lets me know is that when we hit a wall, this is God calling on us to rely on him deeper in prayer, okay? So when things aren't working out, when it seems like there is no opportunity, that means it's clearly time to start asking God for more opportunities. Uh, let me give you another passage, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, also by the Apostle Paul. He writes, Finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as happened among you, and that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men, from, uh, for not all have faith. So what do we see here? Well, we see Paul prays for uh, 
boldly for success in ministry. He doesn't, like I said, pray like some of us sound today. He he's not saying he's not even saying God, you know, you know, slowly but surely bring these things about. He says, no, 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 no. pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored. Okay. Like I said, guys, I don't pray like that. This is convicting to me as I wrote as I looked at this matter uh, to record this video. I'm sure it's probably uh, convicting to some of us as well. It, it, it basically shows that there's a lack of faith in our hearts. That like it's almost that it's almost like we don't actually anticipate God's kingdom to come or His will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Guys, Jesus told you to pray that way for a reason because it's actually going to happen. And then Paul prays for protection in his ministry. He expects opposition. This is another thing that we get hung up on. We think it, sometimes we think opportunities. If they ha, if there is opposition, there is no opportunity. That's not the way Paul saw it. As a matter of fact, he anticipated that as the gospel went forth, there would be opposition, and so he prayed that he would be protected from it. So, bring this all together. What I want for us is to be a church that relies on prayer, not just a church that, you know, prays before bedtime or prays before dinner time or prays once a week in service or anything like that. I want us to be a people who are constantly praying for God's mission and praying for each other. So just to get started, here's some things you can all pray for Reconciled Church every day. So you don't ever have to wonder, like, did this do we not need to pray for this? You can always pray for us for this. First, pray for more unbelievers to hear the gospel through our efforts. We want to see lives change, so pray that we would come into more contact with unbelievers and that they would be able to hear the gospel. Second, pray for wisdom in moving forward as a church. Guys, we are dependent on God's wisdom to guide us and direct us. Pray that he would make us wise as we navigate the future. Third, Pray that God would cultivate a desire to approach him in prayer in our congregation. Meaning, let God put inside our hearts a hunger that can only be satisfied with prayer. We want to be a people hungry to pray to God. People uh, zealous to pray for to God. So, that's what I have for you guys this week. This also brings us to the end of our series. Uh, if you know me, annually I'll do some kind of version of this where I kind of go back over our core values and such. I hope this has been helpful for you guys. Um, I hope it excites you. Um, as I do this stuff, um, it excites me. I'm like, I like what we do. I believe in what we do. I believe that, that we are focusing on the things that actually matter. So that said, guys, love you all. I hope it's helpful and I will see you soon.